welcome to Artificiality, brought to you by the founders of Saunders Studio. Artificiality is a podcast dedicated to understanding the emerging community that is humans and machines. We take the latest in the human side, decision science, psychology, and design, and put it together with advances in artificial intelligence and big data so that you can understand how to work better with machines and your fellow humans. We founded Saunders Studio to help people be more human in the age of AI. We're on this learning journey too, so we strive to find the frontiers, to ask the best questions, and stay curious. We interview some of the top minds working at the intersection of humans and machines, and make sure we have a few laughs along the way. We hear a lot about harm from AI, and how the big platforms are focused on using AI and user data to enhance their profits. What about developing AI for good for the rest of us? What would it take to design AI systems that are beneficial to humans? In this episode, we talk with Mark Nitzberg, who is Executive Director of CHI, or the UC Berkeley Center for Human Compatible AI, and Head of Strategic Outreach for Berkeley AI Research. Mark began studying AI in the early 1980s and completed his PhD in computer vision and human perception under David Mumford at Harvard. He has built companies and products in various AI fields, including the Blindsight Corporation, a maker of assistive technologies for low vision and active aging, which was acquired by Amazon. Mark is also co-author of The AI Generation, which examines how AI reshapes human values, trust, and power around the world. We talk with Mark about Chai's goal of reorienting AI research towards provably beneficial systems, why it's hard to develop beneficial AI variability in human thinking and preferences, the parallels between management OKRs and AI objectives, human-centered AI design, and how AI might help humans realize the future we prefer. Mark, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Maybe you could start with giving us uh, an intro to the Center for Human Compatible Artificial Intelligence. The Center for Human Compatible AI, or CHI, was founded in 2016 by uh, uh, Stuart Russell, um, who is one of the leading lights in artificial intelligence and, and wrote the standard textbook. And, uh, uh, and uh, it was founded together with uh, a group of, of uh, PIs, of investigators, um, to uh, really to reorient AI, and this is this sort of official statement, right? Reorient AI towards provably beneficial systems, um, and that that's saying a lot. Um, and and it's what's what's not stated, but what is understood is that that um, as AI becomes more powerful, uh, it becomes uh, uh, you know very dangerous, and uh, making safe AI is a challenge and we really need to build AI from the ground up to, uh, to, to assure that it, 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 we can prove things about it and uh, that it is in fact uh, beneficial. It is doing things that people want. Why is it so hard to build AI that's beneficial? Why is it so easy to build it so it's dangerous? Well, it, it's really, uh, you know, the way I think about it is advancing computing, and especially if you advance computing in, in the context of ubiquitous computing, where all the machines are connected and they're all connected to the things that we, uh, that we care about in our, in our infrastructure and, and, uh, and we're carrying them in our pockets. And, uh, and, and if you think about it, you know, half of the population of the planet um, it determines what to think about in the morning when they wake up based on some algorithms that are determining which you know, news articles or other articles to look at. When you have this kind of situation, then the, the uh, impact of an algorithm uh, is just staggering. And then when you think about how these systems are built, they're, they're built just like any engineered system with, uh, with a you know, well-defined objective. Right, and uh, and so the the real um, problem, as we see it, is that when you have a system with fixed, you know, um, specific, you know, pre-specified objective, 
is going to pursue that objective. And um, uh, that, um, uh, you know, there is no way to uh, anticipate uh, the impacts of this. Now, when you have a system like, you know, a chess game, then its objective of winning that game, uh, you know, is, is, is relatively harmless because it will just tell you where to move the pieces and uh, uh, it, it isn't really integrated into the more organic world of people. Um, but as, as, you know, as the systems are, uh, have broader impact um, and are, are connected to essentially every human activity, um, uh, having a, a simple objective um, uh, such as, you know, maximizing, um, you know, keeping people glued, right. Maximizing the, the, the what's called engagement, uh, for, uh, for, for YouTube can have some pretty serious consequences. And so, so uh, the, the idea of fixed objectives is what we see as the, as the old model for AI and measuring the success, uh, or the, you know, calling a, a system intelligent, uh, uh, to the degree that it uh, achieves its objectives um, has got to be supplanted with a, a, a new definition where uh, a system is um, uh, is is um, beneficial uh, to the degree that it achieves our objectives, and we can't write those down. If you think about a you know, a Roomba vacuum. Um, it's got a simple objective. It sort of moves around and sucks up dirt. Um, but then it sucks up some of your jewelry and you, you, you've got to reprogram it so that it doesn't suck up jewelry. And then you've got new definition, which is dirt, but not jewelry. And then it goes over your cat, right? And you say, okay, well, no cats. And you could see how that, just that small example, um, well, uh, trying to write down what uh, our objectives are all in advance is is really the problem, and so this is where we uh, we are pursuing uh, a, a sort of re rebuilding of AI and all of the subfields of AI on this new foundation. So that sort of flips the script, if you like, of um, the way that AI has traditionally been done, which is humans specify the objective and then set the AI to achieve that objective no matter what. And it's incredibly effective at that if you can specify that objective tightly. And you're saying, uh uh, the best way to do it is to leave the, is to set the AI's objective to figure out what it is that we want and to constantly monitor and, and, and solve for that. I'd say that, that, um, that pretty much captures it. There, there are a few problems because, um, we, uh, are, are you know famously uh, unaware of of our uh, preferences, and um, uh, they change in you know in situations and from from society to society and from family to family and person to person, and you know year to year and moment to moment. So um, uh, I think what we're doing is we're um, uh, we're acknowledging the. Uh, the, the limits of how specific one can be, um, we, we do assume that there are some sort of initial objectives, right? But then we need to introduce the, the, the idea that, that the system be uncertain about the objectives. Yeah, this is making me sort of think about um, Danny Kahneman's latest work on, on uh, variability in human thinking and presumably variability in noise and human preferences and how you get an a if it has you know what that what his work there says is this is um statistically measurable uh, and uh that's got to be something that a machine's actually able to do is statistically measure when our preferences are somewhat um, not quite random, but certainly variable. In computer science, we have a model that we work with. We have a model of the user when we're building a product, and we have a model of the 
you know, of the human when we're working on an interactive system. Um, and, and our model of the uh, uh, human now has to include preferences about which we know little. And, um, and uh, in, in some of our work, uh, a, a, a view onto the behavior, right, which gives us hints about the preferences, but which is noisy. Um, sometimes you ask a person and they'll tell you, oh, yes, I have a very high tolerance for risk. Uh, and then the stock market goes down and they sell everything, right? And uh, that means that they actually don't have much tolerance for risk. That, that, and so we observe behavior. Um, we observe, you know, uh, the, the, we, we can have a system that actually makes inquiries, right, that, that uses a pedagogical uh, uh, model for um, people teaching it. Um, what what to do and how to do it. And I think it becomes easier, uh, just just as any uh, uh, you know scientific pursuit. If you narrow it from, we're going to make an intelligent system that is generally you know usable, useful to a uh, a particular kind of system for doing a particular kind of um, uh, task, and so the the. Uh, uh, in in uh, uh, in you know the, the robotic side of things, right? We're, we have uh, Anka Dragan, who is our rising star roboticist, uh, working with us at Chai, and and she's um, moved the you know the concept of of what the robot is trying to achieve from getting the job done. Which, which uh, sort of is, is the old model, and it, and it and it sees a human as a as an obstacle to avoid, uh, uh, and where it has its sort of intrinsic objectives to um, uh, getting a job done, where the objective is is uh, uh, something that the human wants to do, and it's got a, an initial idea of what it is, but we're going to build this thing together, and then the human can grab the arm and say, no, over here. And we'll say, ah, must be over there. Cause the human said, I should move my arm over there. And that, that, um, some of the results, uh, apply, uh, to, to, uh, autonomous driving and, um, uh, and, and, you know, robots in, in, uh, in collaborative, um, environments in, you know, in manufacturing surgery and so on. It's interesting when you're thinking about objectives and the current design is about setting an objective and there can be multiple objectives, but for instance, you're saying engagement, right? That's a classic, you know, YouTube's algorithm is designed towards engagement, try and keep people watching more and more. There's sort of an interesting question in there because I think about it as there's sort of two things that you've raised. One is the sort of concept that perhaps the machine could help us understand our own preferences and therefore understand our own objectives. And we know that's difficult because we don't sometimes don't even know what we prefer. And we have a lovely long history of being poor at establishing our own objectives. You know, we are either incorrect about stating them or they're not complete. We don't understand whether objectives were good ones or not until they've failed. Um, and, if I then take the next step, which is thinking about how we as humans most effectively have established objectives, um, I can't help but draw the comparison to OKRs, you know, objectives yeah. and key results, the management theory that has driven one of the greatest AI companies in the world, Google, since its inception. Um, uh, and think about how those objectives are set collectively um, and, uh, on a quarterly basis from the bottom up. It's not a top down, but it's from almost from the user up to the top of the system, not the top of the system down. But they're set quarterly and then they're revised. You can change them. You're assuming that there's a certain failure rate, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it then feels like companies like Google, not just Google and specifically, but companies like Google have set grand objectives that don't change, or at least we don't see them changing as humans. We don't see the change to go, Mm, we're going to revise that objective because things aren't going so well, right? Now, these systems are so much more complex, it may be difficult to do on a quarterly basis. But I still sort of think about that as like, if that's the best as we as humans can do for each other, 
then how mm-hmm. should we think about setting objectives for our machine employees, right? Which is the term we've used for years now to think about AI. Have people think not just about them as machines, but think about them as machine employees and how you manage and, and set OKRs for them. Let's just say the new model that we are building towards at Chai uh, does not do away with uh, objectives. It, it, it does away with uh, with the you know the the um, uh, simple concept of fixed and complete specification of objectives before you've got the system working, and at any, any given time, one could describe an operating you know machine uh, and an operating person who's trying to achieve something uh, as having objectives, um, but we have objectives at multiple time scales at any given time, right? I'm speaking with you now. I want to make sure that that's, you know, an engaged and engaging conversation. Um, and I, I have other things going on in my life, which have a you know, longer time scale, like what's going on um, uh, at the lab, you know, this week and our next uh, couple of weeks leading up to our annual conference and so forth. Um, and, and I think that um, uh, that is one of the great um, uh, challenges for uh, you know the, the the necessary breakthroughs, the, the you know the leaps that are necessary in AI um, for it uh, to uh, to advance um, you know towards this uh, I think um, vaguely defined holy grail uh, of of general AI, right? And if it's going to be um, uh, helping in a, you know, it's sort of a very general sense to, to do any uh, cognitive task with us and for us, then uh, it needs to be able to uh, handle um, uh, objectives and, and uh, think at multiple timescales. Mm. Um, getting back to the, 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 the way we run corporations that it just makes me think of um uh, I, I was at a conference whose whose um, uh, theme was the the comparison of artificial intelligence and the corporation. And if you think of corporations, you know, in a certain way, they are the, the you know the first complete operating AI where people are at the end doing the work, but the center of it is really uh, it's got this objective right so so so, you know i was i was an early employee at microsoft and the objective was well there are going to be a lot of computers on everybody's desk and we want to be the company that makes the software for those computers right and that that was you know vague enough that um uh, it projected down to all kinds of things the operating system and then the applications that were necessary and, and possible at the time and so on and then all of the people were building the software um, uh, to achieve that objective. And, and I think there's uh, there's something, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 this, I, I guess the same, the same danger um, with having this, you know, clearly specified objective and also the, the, the time horizon of one quarter. <laughs> um, uh, that uh, that that really leads to uh, harms, you know, so- societal harms um, coming from corporate success, right? If you think of the, the, the corporations that succeeded at what they set out to do, and they get they become massive and 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 completely change uh, society and our lives and so on, um, simply pursuing their objective. When I think about um, the work that you have cut out for you uh, to 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 think about human preferences and human behavior. I think about my own mind and I sit and try and figure out what it is that I want on a given day or, you know, longer term of, you know, just the objectives over my life or what have you. And it, my mind rapidly turns into kind of a hall of mirrors. You know, you just end up with, with so many different perspectives of things that you might want you know, things that you could pursue and, and you might start off down a path and then find that's not where you want to go. Or you might, um, 
use your uh, emotional guidance to pick some of those directions. And it's so deeply nuanced that I wonder how much, like how many, how much do you talk in the lab about whether emotions have to be part of, of a machine for the machine to really understand how human behavior works? I uh, certainly uh, have have participated in discussions about the the primacy of emotions and and if we think of building a machine that is modeling human thinking then uh, it's it's uh, it, it, you know uh, it, it's an essential consideration um, and and I think you'll uh, you'll see a you know much greater uh, literature and and lively um, uh, research in uh, in cognitive science than in AI, right? The the AI researchers who are right now uh, modeling emotions are are doing so for a particular purpose, <laughs> right? They, they need to uh, uh, read, uh, uh, you know, say the 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 grand news feeds and then determine whether uh, the sentiment is moving one way or another. And they, they call that sentiment analysis. And that's what 15 or 20 years old. And, um, uh, but, but when we talk about, uh, you know, when I, when I speak to, to um, my uh, PhD advisor, who's a wise mathematician and, and, and also uh, one of the leaders in uh, computer vision um, in his day, David Mumford. We we talk about the 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 you know almost blind pursuit of building AI and leaving emotions for later. Um, and and I think what that really comes to is that um, we think of the the executive function of the mind as the most important. And the things that we can uh, think rationally about are the most important to to, to model. Um, and uh, and I think that um, as as the the AI systems that, that we were building in a in a box are now plugged into society, right? It's gone from being this this beautiful and contained mathematical entity where you could make proofs about it to some something more organic and becomes sort of like organic chemistry and, and so forth. And I think that um, puts us in a position where we're, we're almost studying nature. Um, it's not that we're studying our creation, right? Com- you know, computers and, and the programs that we create, but, but what happens when you plug that in with, um, with nature, and uh, and that could be studied in in a way that um, you use some of the you know natural sciences um, techniques. I love the back and forth that happens between um, the the natural sciences and computer science, and I think there's so many uh, fabulous examples of, I mean, at minimum, inspiration <laughs> between like you know reinforcement learning and and. And animals and reinforcement learning as a computer science technique. You know, there's just so many great documentation of that. But it's it's like that's almost um, uh, it, it, those inspiration points are, are almost sort of accelerating in the sense that if you could think about if we want to have a, of artificial intelligence that truly helps us in the way that you're talking about in terms of beneficial AI and so can reflect back to us things about our preferences that I'm, I'm thinking about a personal kind of AI at the moment, but things back to us about our preferences or our achievement towards our own personal goals or hurdles that we need to be more conscious of or improving our uh, ability to be metacognitive, to be self-aware, to think about how we're progressing towards our goals. Then um, modeling our emotions as an individual seems like a perfectly rational approach. It, the, the ability to get a lot more information about ourselves when we understand more about how our emotional reactions to things d- drive 
desirable or undesirable behaviors. So we see these really simple examples. I mean, I know they're complex technically, but they're in a use case kind of way, they're simple, like uh, computer vision, recognizing that you're frustrated when you drive, for example. I'm thinking of some of the stuff that Affective is doing. Mm -hmm. Um, And we've talked to them before on the podcast. And they've, they've almost made this transition from emotions as identifiable by um, the the way that facial mus- muscles react uh, behave to inferring it in a state they've stepped away from that a little bit and said well we can see that someone is looking at someone out el- something else or has mm-hmm. this kind of brow furrow so they've stepped back from inferring the way that someone's feeling inside but nevertheless the science is still really useful because it's able to say someone isn't looking at the road they're looking at their phone those kind of steps and it's almost like they took this it's almost like there's this there's this path that you can take that's really quite um it goes backwards and forwards between like hard math of computer science and what's actually truly discoverable and and can and the science upholds it about human behavior and then going over to the natural sciences side and saying well what if we knew something about ourselves that we didn't know or that we can have fed back to us in real time or some something that ai can do that nothing else can do you know outside of our conscious awareness um, things that are you know, skin conductivity, whatever, those sorts of things that can be datafied, we get that fed back to us in a way where it, it it's it's um, linked to our behaviours. It's linked to the way that we're pro- pro- progressing with our goals rather than being sent to some great algorithm in the cloud and sent back to us instead as, you know, click on this. It's actually much more of a reflection of some of our inner state, but in a way that we still have control over. It's that, that to, to, uh, to me, that's kind of the essence of human-centered is that you, mm. you get it back to you in a way that makes sense to you rather than you get it back to you in a way that you're supposed to respond to. You know, this is a, it gives me flashbacks um, um, because, you know, there were waves in the past when uh, computation it was first thought of as, um, uh, you, you know, a, a kind of extension of, you know, human analysis. And we were going to use computers uh, to understand ourselves, to understand groupthink, right, to, to, uh, to drive Madison Avenue, to assure the election of a particular candidate, right? And, and at that time, I mean, I, I, was, a, I was a kid and I was taken to, uh, uh, by my mother to a, um, a career guidance um, uh, office where they had me answer a lot of questions. And then they fed the answers into a computer, which had this sort of green and white tractor feed stripe paper that came out in reams. And then I read the result and it, and it looked like it was a thoughtful analysis. And it determined that my best choices for career were number one, priest, number two, architect and number three professor and and i think it wasn't wrong but I, i'm just reminded of the uh the, this this faith that we have in the system right but the, of course the, the 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 system was built by us and we need to remember that what what i think is new is that the systems which we are building are are a kind of structure that then takes data in Right, and and this is this part of the challenge as well. It takes data in, and that defines its its internalized probabilities. Then we expose ourselves to the system, and it says, "Well, hey, look, you know, I've been watching your heartbeat. I've been watching, you know, all of these data inputs, and uh, on the basis of having done so with, you know, seventeen million other people, and I've you know clustered them into little groups. You belong in this group." Uh, you're obsessive compulsive and you should do the following. Right. And, um, uh, and, and, uh, you know, we, we imagine that, um, that, uh, that's going to get us farther than, uh, uh, having, a, uh, just, just sort of today's best, which is, uh, we, 
we observe ourselves we talk to each other and we have our doctors and so on. But I, I do think that um, uh, I am modeling this, these, these advanced, you know, data driven systems as uh, amplifiers and they are amplifying what we would otherwise be able to do with a pencil and a thousand years, right? Um, but they're also, and so they, they do have this, this great uh, value in, in revealing things to us that we would not otherwise see, right? Okay, well, there are trends that no human could possibly have come up with because you needed 12 trillion data points in them. But um, because they are completely data-driven, it makes it very difficult to prove something about the system's behavior in certain situations. And if the system's output is going to affect individuals and, and, you know, whole groups and our environment and so forth, then we want to be pretty sure that it's doing what we think is beneficial, right? It's doing, uh, you know, not, not necessarily uh, the, the, again, completely specified in advance objective, but, you know, roughly what we had in mind and certainly aligned with the the kinds of things that we think of as beneficial. And uh, right now it's very difficult to prove things about, um, you know, uh, a system that's, that's a, that's a, you know, massive language model or um, these, these, you know, data driven systems. They're, they're, you know, the, the performance is astonishing and, and sometimes, uh, uh, it really looks like the machine has come alive, um, but in fact, it is just uh, you know internalizing the probabilities of of, of the, the the data that's that's been fed to it. The, um, the Chai has a uh, has, has a statement about developing a new model for AI, and which has three parts. And I'm I'm interested in the first one. It says. Um, at least in one of your reports from a couple of years ago, the, the words were that the machine's objective is to help humans in realizing the future we prefer. And I love that. Um, as a fan of existentialist philosophers, right, um, that fits very much, you know, in sort of my, you know, fandom and spot of, you know, great thinking. Um, I'm wondering if you have any examples of AI systems that do that because realizing the future we prefer is so difficult and complex for us to do in our own minds. And so therefore to to design a machine that can actually help us do this really difficult thing that we don't really know how to do ourselves very well. I mean, it's an enormous, wonderful goal. I'm just wondering, have you see, is there, do you have any examples of things that are going in that direction that you think are beneficial in helping us realize the future we prefer? I, I'm going to uh, uh, to talk about recommender systems, it's the systems that that decide what we see first and what we see next when we uh, look at um, YouTube or or go to a news site or, um, or or even you know search Google, right? And we search for something by giving a few um, phrases, and then Google finds. Um, uh, you know, many, many millions of responses that match and then puts them in a certain order based on uh, my past behavior and the past behavior of uh, billions of people um, over trillions of transactions, right? And and, uh, and, and those systems um, have really affected uh, in, in a big way um, how we think and how we interact and, you know, I have to say, I did not lose any friends to COVID, and I'm grateful for that, but I lost friends to recommender systems, <laughs> um, you know, in that sense, right? And, and right, it, 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 uh, I think the fallacy that, that Stuart Russell brings out in, in, um, uh, in, in the book Human Compatible is this, this idea that um, a, a recommender system assumes that a person is has uh, preferences and we're just going to determine what they are and then we'll give the person what the person wants right and and uh, the, the, the fallacy is that when you present something to a person you change them 
right? That dropping a thermometer into the teacup changes the temperature of the tea, right? And, and so you, you can't um, uh, you, you can't present uh, over and over uh, lascivious or or uh, uh, things that make people angry. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, you can't present this kind of content and uh, and not have it change a person, right? And so. If we are going to, uh, and, and you've asked for an example of a system that, that, that really is uh, helping us realize the future we prefer, if we're going to take this to the next step, and, and I, I assure you that there are people inside all of the big digital firms that really, truly care about this, then we're going to need to me- find ways to measure and feed back, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the 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 future that we prefer. So, for example, well-being. Uh, it turns out that if you ask people how they are in terms of well, how have you been feeling right this last week, you get a measure of well-being that overall is a useful one, right? Individuals um, may 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 not be reporting accurately, but in the end, you get a sense of it, and so you can have a system that is measuring well-being along various. Uh, 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 axes and then feed that back into the the search results and and have a system over the course of several months lift up the sense of well-being in the population that it is interacting with and so this is this is all in in the in the world of experimental um i'm not sure i, I i'm not sure how much is um, in production and that we're using, but I, I, I can tell you that there's an example of a much more explicit news uh, uh, aggregator um, called improvethenews.org. And uh, it seems to have just come around the corner um, where you can put in settings um, uh, that, that, you know, help improve um you know your experience, but then overall uh, improve the, the experience of all the other users of this of this thing. And it's it, it's I I describe this. You know, this is your your you know typical iPhone, right? The phone has a bunch of icons, and each icon represents the interests of a corporation, and is there to serve the corporation by giving you a little bit of something you want and then getting the corporation what it's supposed to get, right? And, and here, if you have improved the news as one of your icons, it is not serving uh, a corporation, right? That's why it's improvethenews.org. Um, and you, you, you can, you know, choose on, on with sliders whether you're more interested in provocative writing style versus nuanced and whether you want a little bit more in-depth detail or whether you just want superficial and whether you like um, things that are, that are, um, uh, you you know, more critical thinking versus more pro and so forth. And then through the interaction with the growing audience, it it really is doing better. Um, and, And so that I think is an example of creating the, you know, the, the future we, we prefer, but it is you know, at large, um, uh, that, you know, that's a, that's a, a very, very ambitious, uh, goal. But if you interpret it in, you know, any specific system, systemic situation, then you really can project it down to, to real, um, real systems and, and ways to make those systems, um, serve us, and, and in that sense, the, the, the future I prefer is with my floor properly vacuumed and uh, my jewelry still intact and my cat unfettered. <laughs> the, um, this idea of being able to sort of go to a future that you prefer um, and thinking through how humans think about their lives and think about their choices when they, you know, as life sort of rolls out. And um, Daniel Gilbert was famous for his research on affective forecasting and being able to 
forecast in the future how you're going to feel about a decision. And, you know, one of the things that I took away from his research was that we're much more adaptive than we think we are. And that when, um, that our ability to respond to situations is actually part of our agency and part of how we make decisions. And I, I wonder at that point how much we can have, we can expect or we can hope for AI that might be able to help us through some of the tough spots, might be able to show us a person that we could be or a society that we could be, not just measure how we're going along the way, but provide more of a, um, a, a, a an, an aspirational vision of the future, if you like, even if that includes um, something that's uncomfortable. You know, you sort of got to go through something that's hard to get to that sort of next phase. Is there any any thinking or um, work in the lab or or cross disciplinary research that has caught your eye or that you you guys are thinking about that that help us as as a society or as individuals deal with um, the hard things that give us meaning or that take us forward in our lives? You know, one of the things that we're getting, not from necessarily what we would consider advanced artificial intelligence, but simply the gathering of data about people and about people's behavior in certain situations and the kinds of, you know, so you, you start by collecting intent and then outcome, right. And, and, uh, and sort of people's paths. Um, I, I'm, I'm unaware, but would hope that, uh, that, in, you know, given the tens of thousands of, of researchers that have diverted their attention to uh, using data science to, to improve our lives, uh, that, that there are, um, uh, strands of research that are collecting this and then would that would allow a system to um, uh, to to essentially give us hope right and see uh, potential in us that we don't see right i'm 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 uh, a great student of the stories that people tell by how they live, which they are unaware of when you talk to them actions speak louder than words and we we tend to tell stories generally central conflicts in our lives um by by reliving them and recreating them and so on uh and and to have uh, uh you know have such deep interactions with systems i mean they're interposed between all of our activities not uh, able to use that uh to to find uh uh, you know, find examples that that would really surprise me. There, there, there are examples of people who started off as, you know, as I did in one field, and then landed in another, and and were successful. And you know, this is a friend of mine just recently told me. I, she said, I feel, I feel terrible about today's college kids because they are. They, they, they seem to be operating under the misapprehension that they need to choose a career <laughs> and they have what five decades ahead of them. And there's all of this, this agility now in the, in the world. You don't go to the library and ask the librarian for how to find a, a fact. You just find the fact you find the, the, the you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the passage in the obscure article, right. Within a minute. And so the, the world that they are coming into is so different from uh, the pre-internet world. And, and I would think that it's a reasonable thing to assume that they might have five careers, you know, to, with, with the tra- two years of training and eight years of exercise and then the, the next one. And so, so um, uh, getting back to the career advice that I got, <laughs> I think that that was perhaps a sort of prototype of what is now possible in a much more nuanced way uh, that could use the far richer data available um, about um, not just career, but, but pursuits and, and development of, of, of us in, in, 
the kinds of directions that we have the potential for or the desire for. Well, yeah, it oversimplifies it to, to say that there's these sort of uniquely human skills. I mean, we seem to, uh, uh, anyone in the field of AI is always obsessed with the uniquely human skills. You know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, but it, the way you're talking it sort of sparked an idea in me that one of the ways to think about um, your future, if you're at college now, is that um, th- what the internet's done is enable a, a many more explore exploit cycles in your career. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. to be able to go out and do something new and get new data and le- learn new skills specific to that domain, and then exploit those and then move on to the next one because these core human skills, whatever they end up finally being, not that they ever will get to that point, but you know the the complex problem solving or the 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 more complex goal setting or the the you know um places where humans need to be accountable that's the only place that 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 uh if you put an ai and someone actually has to be stand up and say that this was my i'm accountable for that outcome that all of those things there's just many more opportunities to do that and I did want to go back to a, a thought that you sparked at the start of that conversation, which was one of the most useful AIs that I use for exposing my preferences and how they fit with others and how they might not be compatible. Like I want to be environmentally conscious, but then I want to buy something that's not. Um, it's actually Pinterest. And, you know, I find the, 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 the Pinterest user experience is so rich and um, so you can see more transparently how these things kind of fit together. And some of it's because it's so image driven. It's not like mm-hmm. a Google search where you just you lose track of what you've searched over time. But being able to have these boards that pin, that, that show you what how others think about the same thing, you know, their concept of this AI taste graph, I've actually found Mm. that really, really useful. And it does change over time. You know, I do have a different thing, a different relationship, different experience on Pinterest if I'm looking for one particular thing right now versus, and I've got something like commerce minded, I want to buy something, versus Mm. if I'm collecting an idea that I'm working on over time. You know, redoing mm-hmm. the bathroom. What are the different ways I might want to do that? Versus, oh, I like those shoes. I'm going to go and look at. You know, it's a. It's. Mm-hmm. I think that that there's a really interesting, almost duality to the to the way that you experience the AI behind Pinterest in that sense. Well, Helen and Dave, I am going to speak to Pinterest because it seems to me that we are not working together. You know, with respect to the recommenders, and uh, and that there's something there. Mm. Um, I, I will uh, I will tell you that we have a good relationship between Pinterest and 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 the Berkeley AI Research Lab, but um, but not in this direction. And I think we can use uh, that relationship and and uh, and work together on understanding a different kind of recommender. Right, where where. Uh, pictures speak louder than words or something like that. Hmm. Yeah. And the fact you preserve it, you're saving something for your future. You've got a little right. time capsule right. that you're building over time. It's interesting. You, you, you hear about, you, you know, you hear about divisions being uh, amplified by say YouTube uh, or Twitter. You don't hear about divisions being amplified by Pinterest. And, and mm-hmm. so there's, there's something there as well. And I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to look at that. Yeah, well, there doesn't seem to be so much harmful, um, as James Williams says, overwriting of mm-hmm. advertising. Mm-hmm. It still seems to stay in that more underwritten frame rather than just yeah. overwriting all the media content. And I think the core part of that is that the – the core action that at least I have with Pinterest, there's a discovery, but then there's a choice. I'm actively making the choice to pin something. So my, I'm doing a lot of active building of my, of what I see and what I interact with and what I create as a future idea. I don't, there's obviously things that are recommended. There's ideas that are Mm. put in front of me, but they don't just sit there. 
right? I, I can choose to include them in a board or I can just mm-hmm. kind of move on. Mm-hmm. And I wonder whether there's something there. This is very much of a, a non-provable hypothesis, right? But I wonder if a certain amount of that ch- active choice on the part of the Pinterest user is something that helps not have, which helps have a more beneficial experience, at least for me as an individual. Well, and their object, that objective aligns, right? So um, the two great, the two really good research papers that I liked from from Pinterest was about building the taste graph, and then mm-hmm. there was another one about discovering different different preferences um, based on the intent of the user, going in to find one specific thing versus building something over time. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that building something over time um, really does align with um, – now, the objectives align because they want to um, allow you to journey into that place and put in a certain amount of your of their, recommend, re, their recommendations um, but not overbalance it towards um, – not allowing them to discover your tastes because they want to discover your tastes. I think it's very different when you're building something or even when you're just noting something for future reference, if you're going to have to look at it again and live with it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you're, if you're just getting your news from one of the aggregators and, uh, you know, just like watching a horror film, you cover your eyes and then open your fingers a little bit and you want to see the most horrible stuff, right? But if you had to live with that, you, you know, I, I don't know, uh, uh, I'm, I may just be, uh, uh, you know, placing myself in a very specific cohort of people who don't want to be looking at gore every time they open it, right, the, the particular page. But I, I think it, it does speak to something that you're going to have to live with it. Right. And, um, uh, versus you're looking for a distraction, um, and, and perhaps being overstimulated. It's, it's, uh, I have to take the, the opportunity while the recording is still on to acknowledge Helen and Dave, because I remember meeting you when you had started something called intelligentsia, just, just, you know, as as AI was starting to catch a little bit of wind again, right? It wasn't yet something everyone was talking about, and um, and now here we are uh, in your Odyssey, uh, uh, talking about artificiality. I, I just love it, and I'm, I applaud you, and I'm grateful to be able to speak with you. Well, thank you, well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to have you on the podcast, um, and we look forward to the. Um, a success of Chai being able to actually get more AI that helps us um, realize the future we prefer. Um, I recognize it's a difficult choice to ask for examples, um, but maybe we'll come back in some number of months and years and there will be g- good examples. I hope so. You know, to, to reference. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's been a solid state.